hasn't got the headset. By the way, that was very entertaining. I enjoyed that. So, did you like the football bit? I did. I thought I'd just get it in just for you. I did. I enjoyed our, our chat a few months ago. Me and Richard did a, uh, a, a little event a few months back and I realised within about three seconds that Richard knew absolutely sold all about football. <laughs> And I was interviewing you. And you was interviewing me, which you know, made for an interesting afternoon, but we got, we got we through got it. We got through it, didn't we? <laughs> well, it is great. But thank you very much uh, to you guys for, for coming along today. Um, I, I think it's, it's been an interesting four years, to say the least. Um, those of you who might have heard me speak before and have, and have heard my story, I'll, I'll, I'll run through it very briefly. Um, so in 2020, I... Uh, was speaking to some doctors uh, that were friends of mine. In February of 2020, this was, um, just as we were starting to hear little bits in the media about this virus in China. Um, and both of them had said to me that day, uh, well, we've seen, the, we've seen the data from the Diamond Princess cruise ship, and really, there's nothing to be worried about. It's only really going to affect people who are really old or who are already really, it's not really going to affect you know, healthy people that much at all. So I was like, okay, I was, yeah, I was, I was quite comforted by that thought, um, and then uh, I started seeing the media ramp things up, and then I saw on social media two videos that came out of China of two people dropping down in the street. Now I don't know if anybody saw these videos of the uh, just inadvertently falling over in the street in China, and they were trying to tell us that these people had fallen over in the street and uh, this was this virus that was causing it. Causing it. This was just what happened. They just fell down the street and died on the street there. Now, I don't know about you, the first time I saw that video, I went, that ain't real. <laughs> that, and my, my gut just told me there's something wrong about that. Firstly, if you're going to fall over like that, if you're really knocked out like that, you don't put your hands down to break your fall, which is what the two people in the video both did. Like, all a bit odd. So I thought, there's something not quite right going on here. I, there was just something in me that went, something's not quite right. And so uh, I took to social media um, to air my thoughts on what was going on in the world. Now, bear in mind, that at this point, I was working for Sky Sports, you know, in the mainstream media. And um, in about, I think it was about the beginning of March, uh, when all the propaganda was starting to ramp up in the papers. And I took to Twitter uh, at the time, and I put out a tweet which got a reaction that none of my thoughts on Twitter had ever got before. Uh, and the tweet went something like this. It said, why is everybody making such a big fuss about a virus that is only going to affect the really elderly and the already ill? Well, my world changed that day. <laughs> When the reaction I saw to that tweet, like the unbelievable negativity towards that tweet, uh, tweet was quite remarkable. But the really strange thing about it was, it was also one of the most, in fact at that time it was the most liked tweet I'd ever had. But in the replies to the tweet was the most vitriolic abuse I'd ever come across in my life. Now I've spent 17 years playing professional football where every away game I was subjected to horrific abuse <laughs> so I was actually quite used to it um, and it, it, although it was a little bit of a shock at first uh, it, it actually became like water off a duck's back because I, I'd had 17 years of that it didn't really bother me um, because I felt in my heart of hearts I kind of in my gut my gut was telling me something's not right here and everything that has transpired in the last three or four years um, right up until this day, I still think that everything that my gut told me about what was going on these last few years has come to pass and I trust my gut instinct. And to this day, I don't have a single regret about anything that I've done, anything that I've said on social media. If I have got things wrong, uh, and there have been a couple of occasions where I have, I've been big enough and man enough to admit that, delete the tweet, apologize for it because I think that's what we should do when we get things wrong. Um, it's a shame that our politicians don't uh, hold themselves to those standards. Um, uh, but the majority of stuff that I've been talking about for the last few years, and this isn't because of me, I, 
I sat and like we all do, we go down some rabbit holes and we, we listen to people who have done research on, on incredible things. Um, and what I saw happen over the last three or four years was, was exactly what people were telling me were going to happen back in 2020. Uh, and I was, considered, I was considered by my friends and some of my family to be not of sound mind. I'm sure we've had, uh, we've had those questions labelled at us uh, over the last few years. Um, but I have to tell you, on the positive side, and I think it's important that we do this because there is an element of this that does need to be positive. Uh, and I think you know Richard is absolutely right when he says you know we, we've got to look at solutions. Um, uh, and I have to tell you, most of my family, one of my brothers probably still having the, the old jabs, um, but the others have stopped taking them, which thankfully uh, is great. Um, and it, it's just been. Uh, an incredible time where I've seen so many of my friends and so many of my family now who thought I was mad three years ago coming up and going, Matt, I'm sorry. We thought you were mad two or three years ago, but actually with what we've seen happening, you were right and I'm really sorry. And that's and that doesn't bring me any, any pleasure. Um, what does bring me pleasure is that people are starting to think for themselves again because I think that's what we've what we've been lacking. That's what the propaganda was for. It stopped, as Clive mentioned before, about being in fear. Um, it stops your brain from working properly when you're in fear. Uh, and I think now as we're kind of coming out of that cycle, people are starting to be able to think clearly again. And now we are seeing what we're seeing. And I think, I think we are seeing an awakening. It's not happening as quick as we'd all like to. Uh, but I definitely see a massive change in what has gone on in my life, in the reactions that I get to the stuff that I put out on social media now. Um, and so I think we can take great heart from that. You know, there were so many low times, you know, being locked down in your house. Um, I mean, to be fair, I never followed any of the rules. Uh, and I'm sure there's... <laughs> um, that, the rule of six was about the rule of 60 in my house. Um, <laughs> And that two meters, that was about two centimeters, bollocks them. Uh, <laughs> so all those ridiculous rules. And, and uh, as Richard said as well, you know, when they brought in the mask mandates, you know, I, I kind of started looking into the efficacy of, of masks and all that stuff. And I, and I spoke to some experts who were, you know, in, the, uh, in, in that line of work. And they were saying these, these things are, will have no effect. In fact... The, the very little effect they might have is cancelled out by any negative effects that they have. So I was like, well, I'm going to use my own brain. I'm not wearing one. I will not be wearing one. And at the peak time of mask wearing, um, uh, as Richard said, I deliberately went into all the shops. And when I went into those shops, I made sure I was the happiest version of myself I could ever be. I went in them shops with the biggest smile on my face, and I looked everyone who had a mask on, I looked them in the eyes, and I went, morning, how you doing? You all right? And I wanted them to see what they're missing out on because they didn't understand what they were being subjected to. And I wanted to set an example to them that actually, you know, you don't have to comply, and you can be as happy as me if you just take that fucking mask off. <laughs> And I think that is, that is an important part for me, is setting an example to people, keeping your vibration high. Uh, as Richard said, you know, we may not have football in common, uh, <laughs> but on a lot of much bigger, wider, more important issues, uh, we are very much aligned, um, uh, as with Clive as well. And that's why the three of us are here, sat together, um, trying to you know, put out good vibrations to people. Clive obviously trying to help with everybody's health. He's been a, a, amazing uh, to me, actually. I had a, uh, when we did an event together last year, uh, I was having a little problem with my, with my knee. Uh, it's absolutely true. And, um, and Clive was offering to uh, use this, it was the Tesla machine. Yes. Uh, and he offered to um, get somebody to try it at half time in the show. And I was like, well, that sounds interesting. My knee's been a few months. I, I haven't been, I've been I'm walking with a bit of a limp. And uh, so, so I went down at half time and I thought, yeah, okay, in you come. And he used this machine on me for what, five, five or six minutes? Yeah. And uh, he said, right, stand up. Okay. 
So you can have a walk down the corridor. And I walked. And I thought, I'm not in any pain. Where's that gone? I've had that for, that's been there like two months. And I walked up and down the corridor. I was like, that's amazing. I, I, and so that for me, and my daughter also sprained her ankle uh, ligaments badly a couple of weeks ago. Um, she'd been on crutches for about three days. She was in a, she'd been in a boot. She only came out of it on Friday, but a few days ago when she was having time where she could take the boot off and, uh, and let her ankle breathe, I, I, Clive very kindly uh, lent me the machine, which is still in my house. And I thought, oh, I wonder. Uh, so I got my daughter to sit down. I didn't tell her what I was doing. I didn't tell her about the machine. I said, just trust me. Uh, thankfully, she did. She's 14, going on 50 uh, a couple of weeks. And so uh, I used the same machine that Clive had used on my knee. And I didn't tell her anything. I just said, I'm just going to give you a little bit of treatment. And, uh, and it was amazing because she, she'd obviously been in great pain with her ankle. She'd, she'd been, not been walking properly. She obviously, when she did have the boot off, she was quite flat-footed. And, um, and when we finished the treatment, I said, okay, that's it. And I didn't say anything. And she stood up. And, and then she went to walk as she had been walking with a very flat foot. And as she walked out the room, my wife was watching her. And as she walked out the room and down our hallway, all of a sudden, my wife saw her and she started walking properly with very, very little limp. And, uh, and, my, and my wife said to me, I couldn't see her because she'd gone down the corridor. My wife could see her. And she said it was amazing. Her, her face, she walked down the corridor and then she turned to walk back again. And her face is just like, wow, what's happened there? And she walked back into the room and she went, Dad, what's that machine? <laughs> and I went, don't ask me. I said, it worked. I know it's great. It works. Trust Clive. And, <laughs> I, and honestly, mate, that machine is, is brilliant that you've let me in. has really helped my daughter with her, with her ankle. So thank you very much. Pleasure. So, yeah, we find ourselves in, uh, in, a, in a rather strange place. Um, the Great Awakening is happening, although very slowly. And um, I, I think it's been, um, I wouldn't say enjoyable. The last four years for me has been fascinating um, because I've, despite all the abuse that's come my way from uh, not only on social media, but the hit pieces that happen in mainstream media when you know, they decide they don't like you telling the truth, um, uh, I found it's been incredibly uh, character building for, for one. Um, but I think it's been such a, a fascinating time in all of our lives that I think we're going to look back on this and just see how great a time it was for humanity to awaken against the evils that are in this world because like Richard said we are, we are being run by some very very nasty people call them Satanists call them whatever you want, psychopaths but there are some very, very nasty people who do not want us to be healthy. They don't want us to be thinking critically because if we, everybody started doing that, we'd start asking questions about why our governments are doing the things to us that they are doing. Why, why are they poisoning the food supply? Why are they putting fluoride in water? Um, why are they trying to control every aspect of our lives by trying to introduce central bank digital currencies uh, by trying to hand over our sovereignty to the World Health Organization. Um, all that stuff. <laughs> exactly. Uh, and the worst bit about it is, is as, as Richard said, the, the taxation. The, the amount of tax that we pay is horrific. I, 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 put, a, I put a post on, uh, on social media a couple of weeks back and it listed, and I probably missed out a few, <laughs> listed all the taxes that, that have come into effect. And what have we got for it? Have we got a, have we got a better infrastructure in our country? Have we got better... Ro our roads have never been in worse... Yeah, yes. I've had so many potholes when driving on the road. It's absolutely ridiculous. And yet, so we're paying all this money. We're getting no better infrastructure. We get people in the NHS who are wasting money left, right. So the amount of money that the NHS gets, it should be the best in the world. 
It's not because there's people pilfering money left, right and centre, robbing a living through their whatever jobs, middle management jobs they come up with, diversity, equity and inclusion uh, people, um, which is the, bit, the most racist concept in the whole world, by the way. Don't ever fall for that bunch of shit. Uh, <laughs> diversity, <laughs> not having that. Absolutely awful. So, um, so yeah, it's it, it's a fascinating time. And, and as you said, Rich, I, I had a chat a couple of weeks ago actually with with somebody who was looking at ways to legally or lawfully not pay your taxes. Uh, and I think it's a fascinating concept. I think every problem that we have, we could have that we do currently have in in our country, could be solved if every single one of us went. We ain't paying our taxes till you sort your shit out. It's the simplest way. I think it would be the simplest way. If we're talking about trying to come up with solutions, for me, that's one of the easiest and quickest solutions you can have to get your government to start working for the people and not working for themselves and their people that control them. So anyway, that's me ranting on for about 20 <laughs> minutes without... Without taking a breath, <laughs> I do apologise. No, absolutely. <laughs> but I think it's I think it's important. These things are important. But I think it's 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 not just our our well being and, and the government and everything. I think it's important to tie it all together with health and uh, and I think the more people that we have, like Clive, and I think the the natural side of medicine, uh, I think is something that's far more important um, than as you say getting involved with the pharmaceutical company uh, companies who are clearly. Uh, in it for profit and that's the thing that I guess that probably frustrates me the most is that the people who are not awake to everything that's going on how they don't understand that the pharmaceutical companies aren't there for your health they're there for their profits and if they actually invented a cure for things they would put themselves out of business and so they have no interest in curing people. They just have interest in making them just sick enough so that they keep taking their tablets. And that, for me, is the most obvious thing. How people can't see that is a bit of a frustration to me, if I'm honest. Well, it's a frustration for me. If people were to eat better food, and, I'm, and one of my big things is, is avoiding supermarkets, if people were to avoid that and, and eat more healthily, and sensibly, I'm not saying you haven't got to have fun and have a few treats, but if you don't put chemicals and things which are not nutritious into your body, then your body doesn't have to fight those things. And then if it hasn't got to fight those things, you don't end up at the GP who's then trying to sell you, albeit the, well, you pay for it anyway, but it doesn't sell you the, the pharmaceuticals and uh, a little white pill that will uh, have millions of side effects, often including death, mm. especially if it's made at warp speed <laughs> <laughs> from 1984 or whenever it was they uh, patented it originally. But it is fascinating how all the stuff that, that's going on in the world today, if you, if you actually go and look back in time uh, and you look back at films from 10, 15, 20 years ago, how many of the things that we thought were science fiction 10 or 15 years ago actually turn out to to actually be quite true. And you, and I never really thought about it in that way before. Before 2020, I was pretty much, you know, oblivious to everything that was going on in the world. Um, you know, I had my I had my football career, lovely, focused on that. That was kind of all I was obsessed about. I then moved into the media, still talking about sport. Um, and, I, and I really wasn't really aware of what was going on in the world. And it's only been the last four years where you start kind of looking at things and research and then looking back at things and thinking, blimey, they've literally told us everything they're going to do in the films or in The Simpsons. Uh, <laughs> I mean, have you seen that Twin Towers episode? Fucking. Uh, all that shit. Is that, and the predictive programming is, is unbelievable. And now that your eyes are open to it, you start, you start seeing it so much more. Um, and, and I find that I find that quite fascinating, and it, it's, it's such a bizarre thing to watch people who 
ha are, are in the oblivious zone that you were in four or five years ago, still in that zone and trying to talk to them and trying to explain to them. But isn't that, do you not think it's a bit strange that, you know, why are they doing that? What, why do you think they're doing that for? Have you seen that film where they said that was going to happen? And what happened in 2020? You know, and you start talking to people about the uh, simulation event, event 201 that happened just before the pandemic where they actually planned everything in unbelievable detail and it all happened just a few months later. And you can't look at that and not think, hmm, that's a coincidence. <laughs> How many coincidences have to happen before it's not a coincidence anymore? Probably just one. <laughs> well, it's getting to that stage. And how long does a conspiracy theory uh, actually stay a conspiracy theory in this day and age? I reckon we're down to about three or four months now. <laughs> you know, and, and for the mainstream media and for even the politicians now, Penny Morden, in response to Andrew Bridgen the other day, throwing the conspiracy theory line out in the Houses of Parliament. I mean, how fucking childish can you get? I mean, these are the people that we represent us to be the, the you know, our democracy... And they resort to childish slurs of, of conspiracy theorists. And you just wonder, how the hell have we let it come to this? And that's what's happened. We, ha we have to take you know, a little bit of the blame in all this because we, as the people, have allowed that to happen. We've allowed that behavior to happen because we've let it go on unchecked for too long. And they've just kept pushing and pushing and pushing, taking away freedoms, taking away freedoms, taking away more money, more taxes, and we've let it happen. At some point, we have to stand up as a people and go, not anymore, thank you very much. Now. And that's now. Yeah. That has to be now. Because you do know, um, Matt, that I, I, I do hold you quite responsible. Well, not when I say you, <laughs> football in general. You see, because football went on the television and people started watching the television. And the thing that I think started this whole rut is the remote control. Because the minute that you, you, you stopped, oh, God, getting up from the thing and <laughs> getting a picture, hold the aerial up a bit, would you love? I can't watch the match. Whatever, as soon as that remote controlled, for me, it started the whole business about convenience. What was convenient? Because we all got yes. lazy. Yep. You know, it, you can now do this, you can have bigger televisions, you don't have to go out and have to go on the terraces and have a good old punch-up after the match. Um, and, I didn't uh, do that. No, no, I you didn't do it. I didn't suggest for a moment. <laughs> but the rest of your teammates, of course. Um, <laughs> but I just think that's we have allowed, as you say, so much to happen because we've... I mean, it's not our fault necessarily. The school system, so much has just been taking away our responsibility all the time. So that I remember during the pandemic, people were getting people on bicycles to deliver cups of coffee because they didn't even bother to go and didn't go out. You know, you could do it because some bloke would risk life and limb cycling in deserted streets <laughs> when nobody was about with a mask <laughs> and, uh, and deliver food because people were too scared to go to the, uh, the supermarkets where all that whole time the same team of people in close proximity were behind the tills and stacking the shelves yeah. and not dying. That's because they had a plastic screen. Oh, oh yeah. yeah, of course. <laughs> saved everything. And loads of saved hand everything. wash. Saved everything. I wonder if they bathed in the hand wash. It must have been, <laughs> you know. Bizarre times. Bizarre. Well, I mean, when you look back now and think of some of the, the laws or the rules, whatever they, whatever they were, the diktats that were put into place... Um, you know, the people who are still vested in the whole COVID narrative must now surely look back and ask themselves why they could sit down in a restaurant without a mask on, yet when they stood up, they had to fucking put it on to go to the toilet. I mean, just that one thing alone <laughs> should be enough to tell you they're taking the piss out of you. Seriously. Anyway. But, are we going to uh, have some questions? Oh, I, I think we're going, we're going to have Rachel on. Oh, Rachel's going to come. Oh, okay. Um, uh, uh, there is... <laughs> <laughs> Was there um, something you wanted to say first, Clive? Well, yeah. I mean, we've got the Easter holidays coming up. Now, 
when there were the Christmas holidays, the MPs went on holiday, and pretty much nothing bad happened. Yeah. And so funny that. Yeah. I mean, it, it's like there have been a few com- countries where doctors have gone on strike and less people die. <laughs> so I suggest when they go on holiday at Easter, uh, we suggest they never come back. Never come back again. <laughs> Lock all the doors.